Hi, my name's Scott Gould. I'm the uh, screenwriting instructor in the creative writing department. And uh, uh, I'm here tonight with my friend and colleague, Dan Murray, uh, as we present to you a collaboration between the creative writers and the drama department. Uh, I'd like to thank Dan and his students for allowing us to uh, make a visit into their world. And uh, what we've done basically is uh, the screenwriting students learned the formatting of screenplays and then created short film scripts that we then passed on to the actors to let them interpret and do what they do. Uh, and they were able to give feedback to the writers. And that was such a valuable tool for all of us to, to get this feedback so we can, we can make revisions and then give it back to the actors again to work with. Um, uh, getting this kind of feedback is rare for writers and it's a, it's a really kind of a wonderful thing. Scary, scary for some of them, but wonderful. Um, and, and we hope this collaboration, which we've been evolving over the past few years, uh, is just the next step toward a full-fledged film production program here at the Governor's School. But again, thanks to, uh, to Mr. Murray and to the uh, actors for letting us uh, take a little, little journey into their world. And it is a journey. I'm Dan Murray. I'm chair of the drama program. As Scott said, we've been doing this for a few years in the studio without any kind of audience, uh, very cloistered and process oriented. But now, uh, because of or despite the pandemic, we are here to do it in front of a live house in the Saucus Theater, socially distant, and for you at home. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, the writers write and the actors then pick up the scripts, these totally uncharted, never before read scripts, and apply their technique to the, and their intuition and instinct to these roles and do the very best they can to pay attention to the main event. And the main event is the script, as always, and the writers, and to do justice to what's going on in the writer's sensibility. So we hope that we make some great progress toward that tonight. Whatever happens, you're going to be there with us, and we'll all have some surprises. And we really appreciate your support of the Governor's School, of the Creative Writing Department and Writers, and of the Drama Department, of course. So thank you. Uh, pull up a chair and perhaps some uh, microwave popcorn and enjoy these readings. by Christina Sanchez. Edith, 18, female. Kaya, 18, female. Bridgers, 18, male. Harvey, 18, male. Claire, 18, female. Cashier, any age, any gender. Interior, 7-Eleven, day. A group of four friends glide through the aisles of 7-Eleven, picking up things they don't need and putting them back. They converse, but we don't hear it. All of them are sweaty, exhausted, and have found the perfect air-conditioned haven in this gas station. Something about this makes you nostalgic for a summer you've never lived. Interior, 7-Eleven, day. Edith, 18, passionate, has a lot to say, and would be described as any Taylor Swift song ever, fills up a blue raspberry Slurpee next to Kaya. 18, collected and almost too well put together. You know the type. Next to them, two boys lean against the wall. Bridgers, 18, kind and sweet, almost like a golden retriever, and Harvey, 18, slightly grungy and real quiet. 
I just think people die over and over again. Like, you get to seventh grade and boom, you die. Get your first kiss, wham, you die. Driver's license, die. Graduation, dead. College, No, dead. that's not right. I believe you die once and that's gotta be that. He's got a point. Like, you don't actually die, it's just like an old you dies. Exactly, see, Kaya? This heat has you all pessimistic. Shut up. You guys aren't even making sense, right, Harvey? Mm-hmm. See, I'm all shut up. Harvey <laughs> pretends to lock his lips and throw away the key. No, I mean, Kaya, we've all died, you know? Like, are you the same person you were in middle school? Kaya sips her Slurpee slowly, thoughtfully, before having to answer. Yeah? What? Uh, no. no, you're no. not. Kaya, in middle school, you carried around that book about birds and you walked everywhere barefoot and you, like, only ate zucchini or something. It was squash. Either way, you died. Very much dead. All four of them step into the checkout line. The cashier rings up another customer. I think I've just changed, not died. Changing, dying, blah, 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 all the same. Either way, this whole growing up thing is going to kill you, right? I think you've just been listening to too much Lord. Edith makes a face as if to say, maybe you're right. Next! Exterior, 7-Eleven parking lot, day. Edith, Kaya, Bridgers, and Harvey sit on top of a picnic table in the parking lot, sipping Slurpees and eating each other's candy. They're feeling the way we all feel when we're lounging in the sun with people we really love. I think when I get to college, I'm gonna get a tattoo or do something crazy. God, no, don't get a tattoo. That's so not, no, I don't know, not Bridgers. Hey, I say go for it. That's what college is for. Right, tattoos and higher education. <laughs> Harvey, what? How would you know what college is for? You're too busy spraying shoes and playing disco at the roller rink. Kaya, don't be so mean. Sorry, Harvey, that came out harsher than I thought. College talk stresses me out. Yeah, me too. All good, I guess. It shouldn't stress you out. You should be excited, it's new. I'm excited, I guess. I just have all this stuff to do in what feels like five minutes. I don't think I want new. You know, I want college to be summer and 7-Eleven Slurpees and you guys, <laughs> nothing new. Exterior, Bridger's driveway, day. Bridgers and Harvey get out of the car and walk to the front door. Edith jumps out of the car. Wait, wait, wait. Don't forget about Claire's going away party tonight. Uh, she's putting together a scrapbook, so bring a photo of you with Claire. What? I don't keep photos lying around like that. I don't even know if a photo of Claire and I exist. It can be anything, like a yearbook photo or a picture from one of her birthday parties. Anything, really. Harvey rolls his eyes. I think it sounds kind of fun. I mean, I might have to do a little digging, but I'll find something. Great, I'll see you guys there. Interior, Edith's bathroom, evening. Edith sits on the counter applying makeup in the mirror as Kaya stands behind her, fixing her hair. Edith swings around to face Kaya. Edith slumps over, her makeup is all messy and undone, and her legs dangle over the counter. In this moment, she is the embodiment of every child who has ever sat in their mother's bathroom, watching them get ready, wishing they wouldn't go. Are you gonna miss me at college? Edie, of course I'm gonna miss you. No, but this you, the you that I'm talking to, is going to die, and I need you to tell me that the next you will miss me. Like, really miss me. <sighs> oh my god, Edie. I love you, and I'm going to miss you like crazy, but you need to stop with this. But it's true. No! No, it is not. I don't know if this is you being dramatic, but you just have to face things. Our lives change. We change. It is what it is. And I will miss you, but my God, Edie, can you just be happy about the new things? If not for yourself, then for me or Bridgers. Edith sits quietly on the counter, a child who has just been scolded by her mother. Interior, Claire's living room, night. The last hurrah, go crazy kind of party everyone waits for. The music is loud and the lights are colorful and every person there acts like this is the last real party they might ever attend. Edie and Harvey stand in front of the photos people brought and taped up on the wall. 
Oh, my God. Look at Bridgers. He looks like such a baby in that photo. Look at Kaya at Claire's fifth birthday. God, she ate so much cake she threw it up on the lawn. <laughs> Edith laughs, and they pause for a few seconds. I think I know what you meant about dying. Well, not really dying, but yeah. I think I get it now. Really? This may sound stupid. Only if you're talking to Kaya. But the other day I heard that song, you know, the one that goes, and I miss your face like hell. And all I could think about was myself. I miss my face like hell. Harvey points to a picture taped to the wall. Close up on Harvey, Edith, Kaya, Bridgers, their friend Claire, and some others on the beach years ago. The definition of lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. I miss those faces like hell. And missing people you still know hurts a little. I think it hurts a lot because in a couple of years, I'll still miss them like hell, but I won't know them. They will have gone and, and died and become new people, people that I won't know. Edith and Harvey go silent. They stand in front of the photos as though staring at Michelangelo's Pietà, something beautiful in every way, but oh, so sad. Edith begins to breathe heavier and heavier. Interior, Claire's kitchen, night. Edith wanders in. She's distressed and in no mood to engage in small talk, obviously, and yet she's greeted by Claire, 18, warm, and overly friendly. Edith! Oh, how are you? Have you gotten any cake yet? It is so, so, so good. Claire cuts a piece of cake and places it on a paper plate. Edith slaps a smile on her face like Mrs. Potato Head and tries to act as nice as possible, the way you do with acquaintances. Claire, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, have you seen Kaya or Bridgers? No, I have not, but you must come over here and tell us all about your big college plans. No, no, I just, I need to talk to Kaya and Bridgers now. That can wait. Come on, you must eat some of this cake first. Did you know we ordered it from Frank's Bakery? Best in town. So fresh. Here, eat some. Eat! Eat! Oh, and I have to tell you about- No, Claire! Edith walks out, and Claire stands there, cake in hand, a hurt hostess. Interior, Claire's staircase, night. Edith walks through the crowd lined up on the staircase, pushing people around, squirming her way through. Interior, top of Claire's staircase, same time. Edith stands behind the banister, staring at the party continuing below her. Her eyes search for her friends. She looks like an angel, about to start preaching from a cloud of cigarette smoke and southern humidity. Kaya! Bridgers! Someone's got to hear me, please! The music halts. Bridgers, Kaya, and Harvey come running in, looking up at Edith. We are dying! I am dying, and I am going to miss you so much! I'm going to miss this so much! Oh, God. Oh, God, she's having a moment. Kaya, do something. Come on, get her down from there. Uh, no, just let her go on. Oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. Edie, get down from there. You're making a fool of yourself. Edith contemplates coming down, and yet she continues. And I hate missing things before they're gone. I need someone else to miss this, too, because right now, being kids is all we have. I mean, what are we going to do when that's all gone? God, aren't you scared? Silence falls upon the crowd. For several moments, they can hear each other thinking and try to make out the thoughts. I am so scared, Edie. I really am, and I should have told you that before. We don't know what we're going to do when it's all done, but we'll be just fine. Edie, I'm going to miss this, too. Edith looks down and surveys the crowd. She has said her piece and for once no longer feels alone there. She smiles. Exterior, 7-Eleven parking lot, night. Edith, Kaya, Bridgers, and Harvey sit on the curb, sharing a pack of Skittles and eating popsicles. For just this one moment, they aren't dying. They aren't thinking about the end. They are just there, together. Edith gets up and pulls her camera out. Everybody smile. These photos are going to be the best thing we have one day. Okay, 
One, two, three. The camera flashes and she takes the picture. <laughs> they peer at it for a second and stare at their faces, their smiles. I think that's how we should all be remembered. Excited and scared and at the very least, alive. All of them look around, slightly nodding their heads and making faces as if to say, you're right. Fade to black. The Double Pyre by Tate G. Speaking characters. Carly, female, mid-twenties. Orson, male, early forties. Exterior, bar 27, night. Carly, mid-twenties, but carries herself as someone who has seen many more years, leans against the dirty brick wall, smoking a cigarette. The light from the neon sign above gives her a red glow. It is cold, hard to distinguish her breath from the smoke. She ignites the lighter in her left hand and the flame bathes her face in orange for a few seconds. She extinguishes the lighter and slips it in her pocket. Excuse me. Miss. She turns to face him. What? Orson, early 40s, radiating so much confidence that it has to be artificial, walks up from the parking lot. He wears an expensive two-piece tweed suit and brown dress shoes scuffed with ash. His fingers drum restlessly against his thigh. Didn't mean to give you a fright. You didn't? Right. Well, I beheld you and your cigarette there and was wondering if I could impose an inquiry upon you for a bit of combustion. Carly stares at him blankly. He takes a few steps forward into the light. Do you have a lighter? He holds an unlit cigarette in front of Carly's face. His suit sleeves are singed. She flinches, backs up. Uh, yeah? She produces a battered white lighter from her back pocket. He takes it with a smile. I assume you're not a damsel prone to superstition. Don't you know a god with this coloring is rumored to be coveted in misfortune? Never heard that. Close up, Orson's hand pocketing the lighter. Carly's teeth chatter. Isn't it glacial out here? Sure, chilly. Excuse me. Carly drops and grinds out her cigarette, tries to move around Orson to the entrance of the bar. I was he speaking her. to you. You can speak to me in the bar. He, she tries the other direction. He moves the same way, blocking her once more. Carly pinches the bridge of her nose between her thumb and index finger, losing her patience. Oh, all right, as much as I would like him to, my boss doesn't really accept a weirdo won't let me in as a reason for missing a shift. So let me walk the 15 feet I need to so I can get paid, and then we'll have whatever conversation you want. Carly sidesteps him again. This time, Orson doesn't intercept. She widens her eyes and nods in a sarcastic, thanks. She speed walks around him to the bar's entrance. Interior bar 27, moments later. The small bar is busy and dimly lit. Picture frames, license plates, and old advertisements cover the walls. A few men shoot pool in the back. Carly makes her way behind the bar top, signaling the end of the shift of Susan, 55, frazzled. The two women begin a brief conversation we cannot hear. Carly glances to the doorway where Orson stands, watching her. Carly is uncomfortable but holds his gaze. She is distracted by Susan making her way to the door. Orson holds it open for Susan as she leaves. He smiles at her, then lets the door slam shut. Interior, bar 27, hours later. The bar has emptied considerably. Carly works behind the bar with monotonous precision, as if her job has become muscle memory. From the corner erupts loud laughter. Orson holds a cue stick, feigning a fencing match with an invisible opponent. A small crowd has gathered, jeering. Orson feigns a jab left, his feet slip out from under him. He hits the floor with a smack. The laughter continues. Orson jumps to his feet and bows. Carly calls across the bar. Jesus Christ, can you put the cue back, please? The crowd disperses. The door slams as patrons exit. Orson walks to the bar top and takes a seat with a wide smile. He leans the stick beside him. He taps his first three fingers on the bar top with a quick, galloping rhythm. Bada-bum, bada-bum. But a bum. The sound is loud in the quiet bar. Carly glances first at his fingers, then at the cue. That's not where that goes. Well, I might need it again. Not unless you're using it to play pool. Orson continues to drum out his rhythm as he speaks. 
What's your cognomen? My, my what? Your appellation. Moniker? Personage? Designation? Your name! Carly wipes down the bar top, unfazed. Tara. Or Catherine. Uh, Lauren's all right, too. Uh, Jared, Daniel, whatever floats your boat, I guess. Orson's smile drops. His fingers pause. The rhythm stops. He suddenly slaps his palm down on the bar top, and Carly jumps. He stands from his seat and points the pool cue at Carly. I'm not amused with this folly! Calm down, it was a joke! And didn't I tell you to put that back? Oh, don't that goldish, Carly! Incompetent, simple, moronic, cretinous. It vexes me. How do you know my name? The door slams again as the last person in the bar leaves. Orson and Carly are now alone. Bye-bye. He beams, waving ecstatically to the door. He quickly turns back to Carly, smile dropping to a scowl. He hurls the cue stick at her. Carly shrieks and ah! drops to the floor. Did you think I wouldn't know? Did you think I was keen on these games? Well, let me tell you, Carly, I do not enjoy contrivance in any form or fashion, particularly not from you. Orson jumps onto the bar. Carly fumbles for a bottle and throws it in his general direction. Orson raises a hand to block the flying bottle. It bounces off of his palm and shatters against the bar top. Carly scrambles down the length of the bar, stumbling in her haste. Orson reaches Carly in a few bounding steps across the bar top, shoes squeaking on the counter. He looms over her. He takes a few breaths to collect himself, shaking his bottle-blocking hand. The drumming on his thigh begins again. I grew irritated with this mucking about, this horseplay, this trifle. I do not wish to lose my temper with you. I don't know who told you my name, but I swear I haven't done anything. I just work here. Orson jumps down backwards off of the counter. He and Carly face each other from opposite sides of the bar top. Orson dusts off his hands, adjusts his suit, and straightens his tie. So primitive, scampering about on the furniture like this. Quite a dangerous feat to undertake, if I may be so bold as to admit. Who are you? I have a gift for you. How do you know my name? I have a gift for I you. I don't want your gift. I, I want to know who in the hell you are. Orson does not respond. He walks backwards down the bar to Carly's previously shattered bottle, holding eye contact. Carly is persistent. Who told you my name? Orson pulls Carly's lighter from his pocket. He sparks it a few times before igniting a flame. He runs his hand slowly through it. It used to be so quiet in here. You're felicitous, Carly. Lucky I came along. Weren't you watching? He sparks the lighter absent-mindedly, watching his thumb run over the wheel. Normally I am a very proficient fencer, but one can never account for the duality of a building's flooring. Could have gotten hurt. And damaged, battered. I've heard that the recovery process for a broken nose is quite tedious. He pauses, smiles, gestures at Carly. Well, you'd know. Carly slowly brings a hand to her face, touches her nose. How did you know about... Wait, where did you get my lighter? The lighter clicks repeatedly as Orson speaks, a replacement for his drumming. You've got this bobble on your personage consistently, continuously, constantly. I see it. I see you, Carly. Sometimes you light a cigarette with it. And even if you left your cigarettes in the other jacket, you stand outside and spark and spark and spark compulsively just to hear something, as if the ardor of it sustains you. He continues to spark the lighter. Quit it. Stop doing that! The clicking stops. You want it back? I want you to tell me how you know my name, or uh, about my nose, or... The hell, my other jacket? And that's my damn lighter. Then come get it. Orson holds the lighter out over the counter. Carly takes a step forward. They are face to face. The spilled alcohol on the counter glints with the reflection of the lights overhead. She reaches for the lighter with her left hand. He grabs her hard at the wrist. The difference between knowing and comprehending an individual is something like a connection. A mutual understanding. Orson twists her arm so it is palmed down. Carly cries out at ah! the harsh movement. He lights the flame under her hand, eyes fixed on her face to see her reaction. Instinctively, Carly tries to jerk her hand away, but Orson holds her wrist tight. He thinks we have said mutual understanding, yes? That hurts. No, it doesn't. You know what it's like to be burned, Carly. 
I've seen you. Orson lets go of Carly's wrist and she jerks it back to her chest. He leans over the counter towards her. His three beat rhythm begins again. But a bum, but a bum, but a bum. You're a stalker. I'm a friend. Not mine. I'm everyone's friend, a friend of reputation. He holds the lighter out to her again. Impulsively, Carly reaches for it. He wraps his hand around hers as she grabs it. Their hands and the lighter between them hover inches over the wet bar top. Well, your friends were laughing at you. Not with you, at you. They were making fun of you. Someone told you some random crap about me trying to freak me out, but I'm not scared of you. They're not your friends, and neither am I. Orson pulls their hands closer to the bar top. He smiles at Carly, other hand still drumming against the bar top. Oh, them? Menial entertainment. Borderline respect, reserved admiration. Us? Reverence. Confession. Remember your first confession? How you knew that there was no omniscient someone? That there never would be? Just you. Just us. This conflagration, it's not foolish. It's not friendship. It's not divine intervention. It's a sacrifice. Presentation, an offering, immolation! On the last word, Orson spikes the lighter over Carly's thumb and the flame ignites the alcohol on the bar top. It catches quickly, flame dancing towards their faces. Neither of them flinch. Orson releases her wrist. Carly pulls her hand back and looks at the lighter in her palm. You just want them to look at you. You don't even care how, just as long as they're looking. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. The fire spreads across the bar top as gentle blue grows into angry, flickering orange. Carly finally looks up at Orson through the fire. His fingers keep tapping against the edge of the bar top, uncaring of the spreading fire. Her voice wavers. How do you know me? Didn't I tell you? There's a difference between knowing and comprehending. Carly shakes her head, beginning to cry. Orson's tapping slows into an ominous done, done, done. A finger thunks against the bar with each word. A finality, a symbiosis, an attachment, bond, connection, link, tie, codependency, an intimate understanding. To know, to get, to burn, to listen, just to hear something, just to be heard. Carly brings her hands to her face, covering her mouth, done. 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 She is still holding the lighter. Even as she cries, her eyes stay open to watch the growing fire. Done. 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 Smoke slowly obscures both Carly and Orson. Done. 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 Fade to black. Overlook by Dylan Fritz. Mick, man, 30s. William, young boy, around 10. Leanne, woman, 30s. Exterior mountain road, day. Miserable spring day. A lone car drives up a winding mountain road. Interior car, day. Mick, disheveled man, 30s, drives. He has one hand on the wheel and one rubbing his head a grimace on his face. The voice of Leanne, woman, 30s, lingers in his head. Can't you do this one thing for me? Maybe I'll leave you for another man. He'd buy me grapes. <laughs> the woman's voice trails off in a laugh. Mick groans, continues to rub his head. Exterior mountain summit, day. Overgrown grass lines the road. A parking lot and lodge as convenience store lies just off the road. The car pulls into the lot and parks in the one of many empty spaces. Interior car, same time. Mick massages his head with his fingers, groaning with nausea from the winding mountain road. He reaches across the center console and opens the glove box, revealing several pill bottles. Mick grabs one and opens it to reveal green pills. He takes two, goes to close the bottle, but takes one more instead. He places the bottle in his pocket and turns off the car. Exterior parking lot, 
same time. Mick exits the car and wavers. He leans against the car, steadies himself, and walks into the convenience store. A cracked sign to the side reads, no loitering. Interior convenience store, same time. Bell chime, Mick enters, sparse shelves. Maps, snacks, drinks, pamphlets, everything has a faded quality. Mick grabs a trail mix and ginger ale and goes up to the counter where a cashier stands. He glances off to his right, where a father, mother, and teenage boy stand around a younger boy, William, in a wheelchair. William is missing his legs. Mick, staring while the cashier scans his items, makes eye contact with William and quickly looks away. Interior car, day. Mick sits, eating trail mix. He pops another pill and takes a swig of ginger ale. Through the windshield, he sees the family standing in front of the store. They all take turns hugging William, then get in a nearby car and drive out of the parking lot. William sits in his wheelchair, expressionless, alone. Mick reaches to start the car, but hesitates and stares at the boy for a few seconds longer. He sighs and opens the car door. Exterior parking lot, same time. Mick approaches William from his car. You're all alone. It's not a question. Close up on William's eyes as he looks up at Mick. They're white and glassy. As he makes eye contact with the man, another pair of eyes flash across the screen. Like the boys, they are milky, but a bit older and more feminine. William sits just a few feet away from Mick, who stands tall above him. Who are you? I'm just here for the day. Mountain Drive. They left you? What were they supposed to do? Look at me. I'm almost gone. Is this where you wanted to be left? It's okay. It's pretty up here. They both look around. The clouds are becoming thinner, glowing with the sun's rays. How much longer do you have? You're being kind of rude. I'm sorry. I'm out of sorts today. Mick takes another green pill from the bottle and swallows in a gulp. You don't seem all right. Are you okay? I should be asking you that. So inconsiderate of me. Are you okay? The question echoes. Interior living room, night, flashback. Sparse living room, cloudy as if nothing more than a memory. A man and woman come into view. A more put together Mick and his wife, Leanne. Leanne slaps him across the face and Mick grabs her hand. He pulls her close, but they both notice something on her hand. An extreme close-up reveals her hand is shimmering and has a translucent quality. She breathes in sharply. Are you okay? Oh God, talk to me. No, no. Are, are you okay? Through tears, Leanne punches Mick in the shoulder again and again as if it will solidify her hand. Mick takes each punch and then catches his wife as she collapses into his arms in tears. End flashback. Exterior parking lot, day. The words, are you okay, continue to echo until a close-up on Mick's face shows his eyes coming back into focus. He is somewhat dazed. Who are you? Mick still stands on the sidewalk, William by his side. He takes another green pill. My wife. She finished fading this morning. Oh. They told me I'd be gone yesterday. Your poor parents. They couldn't handle the waiting. I don't blame them. William starts to cry. Wait, no, I, I didn't mean it like that. Your parents loved me. Do they? There's hardly anything left of me to love. I, I don't know. I'm sure they love you. People just, people just have to do hard things sometimes. William continues to cry softly. Mick looks over at the parking lot, wringing his hands. Leanne's voice once again fills his head. I just don't know if I want kids. They're so messy. You never know what you're going to get. Mick waves his hand in the air as if to push the voice away. Do you want to take a drive? I'm out driving today. What? I'm going to take you on a drive. I could be gone any minute now. Just like that. He tries to snap his fingers, but at this point, they are more shadow than skin. Don't you want to take a drive on your last day? William takes time to consider. Leanne's voice returns to Mick's wandering mind. 
You can't save me, Nick. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Do you know any cool overlooks? I think so. Let me take you to one. Okay. You promise to bring me here after? Sure. But you do know they're not coming back. I know. I want to be here, though, just in case. Interior car, day. Mountain foliage whips past the windows. Mick sits in the driver's seat, and William gazes out the window from the passenger side. The wheelchair is clearly visible, shoved into the back seat. Mick takes one more pill and a swig of ginger ale. What are those for? My nausea. There's all these curves. I could just slow down. It's fine. You shouldn't worry about me. Mick points out the window. That's a sycamore. I know. Mick pulls the car over. An overlook. Exterior overlook, same time. Brighter skies than before. Clear enough view of a lush valley. Mick drowsily trips over his feet as he exits the car. He takes out the wheelchair and carefully lifts William into it. He takes the pill bottle out and shoves a couple more in his mouth starting to lose track of how many he's taken. The ground, the trees, all become slightly distorted. Images flash across the screen. Interior car, night, flashback. The car has the same cloudy, shadowy quality as the living room. Mick drives somewhat maniacally. Leanne has taken William's place in, in the passenger seat, limbs becoming more and more translucent. We tried, Mick. Everything. It's okay. No. The doctors can help, give you more time. They can save you, I can save you. Extreme close-up on Leanne's eyes reveals they are the same milky eyes that flashed across the screen before. The vision fades, screams echo, and flashback. Uh, Exterior overlook, uh, day. Uh, the screams are mixed, uh, he's huddled on the ground. William lies next uh, to him, with what's left uh, of William's arms, he shakes uh, the fallen Mick. Just breathe, <laughs> breathe. Mick breathes. He stands, wobbles, lifts William up into the wheelchair. What's wrong? Are you okay? Mick is out of breath, leaning against the wheelchair. He notices something towards the tree line. You see that? He points to a glowing woman made of golden light, slightly resembles Leanne, hovering next to a tree. She calls to him something unintelligible. What? No, you're scaring me. Let's go. Let's just get out of here. Come on. I'm okay. You go. I'll stay here. William begins to wheel away toward the road and away from the car. The woman shakes her head. That won't do. Hold me, Mick. Hold me. Mick catches up to the wheelchair, grabs the handles, and pulls William back to the car. I have to get you back. Come on. Hey, let go of me. No, let go. I've got you. Don't worry. I got you. William tries to wriggle out of the chair, but his already dwindling energy makes it easy for even a dizzy, reeling Mick to restrain him. From Mick's POV, the world becomes fuzzy. He stumbles to the car with William in the wheelchair in tow. The scenery softens, blurry edges. Mick's eyeballs blink heavily. Fade to interior hospital room, night, flashback. A doctor leans over a hospital bed, examining the bed-ridden Leanne. Mick sits in a chair to the side, a mess. The doctor looks up at Mick, shakes his head sympathetically. As Mick looks away, the vision fades and flashback. Interior car, afternoon. Mick drives haphazardly, eyes drooping. William huddles in the passenger seat. The light flittering through the windows flickers on his rapidly fading arms. Interior hospital room, night, flashback. Mick stands over the shimmering ghostly form of his wife in the same hospital bed. She is nothing but a wisp of what she was, almost fully faded. Mick runs his fingers through what was once her hair and drops to his knees. End flashback. Exterior parking lot, evening. Mick lies in a bed of flowers outside of the convenience store. Next to him stands the sign that reads no loitering. William sits in his wheelchair on the sidewalk, a couple feet away. His arms are gone, just like his legs. His body becomes more transparent with each passing second. The light from the setting sun catches and glitters within him. For the first time in hours, Mick's mind is clear. What? 
What happened? He took too many of those pills, I think, and kidnapped me. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. This is my last day. This. This is it. I wish I could save you. Are you trying to save me? I don't know. I'm okay. I feel good, I think. The two fall silent. A peaceful flock of birds fly above them, silhouettes against the sky. Are you scared? No. I think I see it. I think it's out there somewhere. What is? I'm not sure. But it's warm. It feels good. I feel good. Nick follows William's gaze out into the setting sun. When he looks back at the wheelchair, it is empty. He waves his fingers in the seat. Nothing. William has faded, passed on. Nick lays back down into the flower bed. Sounds of birds echo around him. The wind blows through his hair. Leaves flutter, flowers sway. He closes his eyes. Leanne's voice fills his head, but he welcomes it this time. I'm okay, Nick. Are you okay? Fade to black. Welcome the Party by Hayden Gavin. Ash, male. Mitchell, male. Oscar, male. Vic, male. Interior school hallway, day. Ash and Mitchell are two high school seniors. Mitchell is a tall, clean, confident looking person. He wears a football jersey pulled over his school uniform, a polo and khakis. Ash is smaller and mousier and wears the school uniform with the shirt untucked. They stand in a crowded hallway between classes. A cheesy banner above them reads, Spring Break is here! in a large red font. Ash reaches into his locker. Tonight is the night! I'm still not sure. <laughs> I wasn't even invited. No one right necessary. They're my friends. We just show up. Uh, I'm just We not. have a deal. Remember? You're coming with me. Believe me. You're gonna have fun. The bell rings. I've gotta hurry. No getting out of this one. I'll pick you up later. <laughs> Mitchell hugs Ash, then runs off. Okay. Love you. Exterior Ash's apartment, night. Mitchell knocks on the door, now wearing jeans and his jersey over a t-shirt. Ash opens the door. He has also changed into jeans and a green hoodie. Mitchell grabs Ash's arm and pulls them away as Ash drags the door closed behind them. Exterior Mitchell's car, moments later. Ash and Mitchell stand on either side of the car. Mitchell on the driver's side, Ash on the passenger side. I'm so excited! You're finally coming to a party with me. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you promised not to bother me about parties anymore if I went to this one. Let's get going then. Interior Mitchell's car, later. The car is dirty, disorganized, and old. Mitchell drives with one hand on the steering wheel, using the other hand to gesture and emphasize his conversation. You're going to enjoy yourself. I heard you the first hundred times. Ash looks out the window, away from Mitchell. I'm serious. You never do anything, let alone come with me to parties. I'm starting to suspect you enjoy doing nothing. You think I'm hopeless? No, of course not, but you're alone all the time. <laughs> you only go places when I take you. You never want to meet any of my friends or go anywhere new. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person you talk to. That's not true, I talk to people. Name one person who's not family or teachers that you talk to, just one other than me. 
I don't know. See? <laughs> Trust me when I say you need this experience. <laughs> Let's get you some more friends. Mitchell turns on the radio. A pop song plays. I love this song. So do I. Let's get the party started, why don't we? Mitchell and Ash sing along. Mitchell focuses on the road. Ash continues looking out the window. Exterior Oscar's house, later. Mitchell and Ash walk side by side to the front door. The door is wide open. The sounds of people talking and music seep out. Ready? I don't know. <laughs> Trust me. Mitchell grabs Ash's hand, pulling him through the door. Interior Oscar's house, living room, moments later. 30 students hanging around. The house is poorly lit, half full beers litter tables, loud music plays, drowning out most of the conversations. Mitchell moves through the crowded space, exchanging enthusiastic greetings with various people. Ash follows behind, sticking to Mitchell's back. Oscar, another senior, is a big, oblivious, bulldog-like kid wearing a football jersey. Oscar greets Mitchell with a one-arm hug. You made it! I almost thought you ran out on me! Never! This is my boyfriend, Ash. Ash, this is our host, Oscar. <laughs> um, hello! <laughs> Hi, I'm Ash! Oscar picks a Ash up in a bear hug, then drops him onto oh, the floor. Oh, good to finally be you! Welcome to the party, man! I don't know how to welcome a party. Oh, <laughs> talk, get a drink, live a little. That's party in 101. The beers are in the kitchen. All right, we'll be right back. To the kitchen? Yeah. Mitchell grabs Ash and leads them to the kitchen. Interior Oscar's house, kitchen, moments later. A small group stands in the kitchen as Mitchell and Ash enter. Plastic cups, pizza boxes, and other snack foods litter various surfaces. Mitchell grabs two of the cups and offers one to Ash, who takes it. Having fun yet? We've been here all of five minutes. <laughs> all right. Go talk to people. Don't disappoint. I don't know what to say. Just be yourself. I like you. So are they. I left some beers in my car. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get them. Mitchell leaves Ash alone. He grabs a cup, drinks, gags, and exits. Interior Oscar's house, living room, moments later. Ash walks in looking for Mitchell. He doesn't spot him. Ash sees Oscar and goes over to him. Oscar sits on a couch with Vic. Vic is a large, jacked-up high schooler wearing a football jersey. He is obviously drunk. Oscar motions for Ash to come over. Enjoying yourself? I don't know. <laughs> Did you get a beer? Not really my thing. <laughs> Do you have anything else? Uh, I don't think so. No. Uh, this is Vic. He's the man. You have it, right? Ha have what? The beers. You seem to be enjoying what someone else brought. Where's yours? No, I didn't bring anything. Idiot's cheating us. I think you're... The idiot said he would bring some more beers, and he's empty-handed at someone else's drink. I never said he that... bring more beers. Vic stands up, leaning down into Ash's face. You calling me a liar? No! <laughs> No, I'm then not. where are the beers? The music suddenly grows quieter, conversations stop, everyone stares at Vic and Ash. I don't know. <laughs> hey, cool off, Vic. It's a party. Vic turns around, looking at Oscar. Don't tell me to cool off. I'm cool. Vic turns around and punches Ash. Ash falls in a heap. Vic gets on top of Ash and punches him more. Oscar jumps up and starts pulling Vic away. Vic! What the hell are you doing? You idiot! Oscar pries Vic off of Ash. I'm gonna kill him. Let me kill him. Vic kicks at Ash. Ash stays on the floor. Oscar pulls Vic away. Let's go to the kitchen, get some water, cool down a bit. Oscar takes Vic away. All eyes are on Ash. Ash struggles but gets up. Mitchell walks in carrying a cooler. Mitchell sees bloodied Ash and drops the cooler with a crash. Hey! What happened to you? Uh, Vic, he... he what are you looking at? Show's over! 
conversations pick back up. Eyes keep drifting to Ash and Mitchell. Mitchell helps Ash onto the couch and sits next to him. Seriously, Ash, what did you do? I didn't do anything. I'm serious. Do you want to stay? I promise. I, I don't care about the stupid deal. What were you saying about Vic? Did he? Oscar walks in from the other room. What happened? Vic re-enters, starts to move towards Ash, Mitchell, and Oscar, but Mitchell intercepts him. Did you do this? Mitchell pushes Vic back. So what if I did? What are you gonna do? Vic keeps advancing. Oscar gets between Mitchell and Vic. Mitchell! Don't start anything! What? You're backing him? I don't want anything to start! What the hell? Ash gets up from the couch. <laughs> no more fighting! Please! Let's enjoy the party! Ash tugs on Mitchell's arm. Ash? Exterior Oscar's house, moments later. Ash pulls Mitchell out of the house, stumbling down the steps, before Ash falls over, Mitchell catches him. Mitchell helps Ash walk towards his car. Interior Mitchell's car, later. Ash is helped into the passenger seat, followed shortly by Mitchell getting into the driver's seat. Mitchell starts the car. The pop song plays again. After a moment, Ash turns off the radio, leaving the two in silence. I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd get hurt. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have made you come. You couldn't have known. But no more parties for me. <laughs> I just can't after that welcome. <laughs> Ash laughs weakly. Mitchell looks worried as he drives away. Fade to black. At a Distance by Felix Killingsworth. Speaking roles, voice, Lucas's co-worker, no details. Irene, middle-aged woman who has been working at a grocery store for over 10 years. Lucas, teenage dropout due to necessity who works at the coffee shop to make ends meet. Operator, voice on police radio, no details. Man, self-interested businessman who's late for work. Exterior, busy city street, dead. Moving aerial shot of an urban street. A coffee shop sits on the left side of the road, several other small stores nearby. The other side of the street is more of the same. It is early afternoon. The sounds of urban life are audible. The clamor of cars and people. A grocery store faces the road with a bus stop in front of it. There's a busy intersection a block ahead of the bus stop near the coffee shop. The commotion grows louder before we cut to exterior coffee shop, dead. Lucas, a teenage dropout by necessity, exits the coffee shop with a black apron over one arm. He wears a uniform and his backpack is slung over one shoulder. See you tomorrow, Lucas. He pauses to wave through the window. Lucas walks to a beaten up, white 79 Ford Mustang. The car is falling apart and wouldn't look out of place in a junkyard. He unlocks the hazard on wheels and gets in. Cut to interior, Lucas's car, dead. Lucas tries to start the car and it sputters with a low whining sound. He tries again with the same result. He tries a third time, and the car backfires with a loud bang. He sees smoke rising from the hood of the car. He slams his palms into the wheel. The Mustang honks weakly before that sputters out, too. Crap. Again? He gets out and slams the door. Cut to exterior bus stop, dead. Irene, a tired, middle-aged woman who looks like she has never once had the urge to smile sits on the bench. She wears a nasty, uncomfortable-looking cashier's uniform that doesn't quite fit her. 
It is early in the afternoon. Lucas walks into the shop. He checks the bus schedule posted on a telephone pole nearby. Lucas glances at Irene before sitting to her right side on the bench. He takes off his backpack and leans it against his legs. Irene pulls out a pack of cigarettes and lights one. Lucas shifts further away from her. Hello. I'm Lucas. And you are... <laughs> Irene ignores him. She takes a drag from her cigarette. Long day. Irene exhales harshly in a puff of smoke. Don't talk to me. I'm not your friend. Sorry. I was trying to be nice. Kid, seriously don't. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Lucas opens his backpack and takes out an old comic book. He opens it, staring down at the panels. He continually glances at Irene while pretending to read. She notices. What are you looking at? He opens his mouth as if to speak, but is cut off by Irene's phone ringing. She holds up a finger on her right hand, cigarette dangling loosely to pause whatever he was going to say. She pulls her phone out of her pocket and answers it. She seems to be listening for a moment. Then she presses a button on the screen and lifts it to her ear again. Yeah, it's me. Who else would it be? No. No means no, you absolute d asshole. <laughs> she hangs up. <laughs> Who was that? Irene glares at him. Sorry. I'll shut up. Not that it was any of your business, but that was my husband. Do you not like him? He's in prison. So no. <laughs> Irene glares at him again, still smoking. Sorry, my dad tells me I talk too much. He's right. <laughs> Lucas I'm... continues speaking like he didn't hear her. My dad's in prison too. Probably for something stupid. Five years for insurance fraud. What about your husband? Murder. <laughs> Lucas looks afraid. He stands up and nervously checks the bus schedule before tentatively sitting back down. Don't worry, kid. You're not its type. Lucas isn't reassured. They both look up suddenly at the screeching noise and a loud crash that erupts from the intersection ahead in front of the coffee shop. Lucas's point of view shows the street ahead of them. The incident is blocked from view by traffic. Cuts to interior moving truck, same time. Extreme close up. Mid out sound of a man's eyes pull back to see the driver with blood running down the side of his face. Driver's point of view of civilian pounding on the window and inaudibly shouting at the driver. Suddenly, a low buzzing can be heard before it slowly escalates to a ringing. Cuts to exterior bus stop, same time. Lucas and Irene haven't moved. What the hell was that? Well, I don't know. Definitely not my problem. Lucas ignores her. He stands to try and see what happened. Sounded like a crash. Should we call 911? You did hear me, right? Irene rolls her eyes. Don't bother with 911. They're probably flooded with calls from good Samaritans right now. Close on, Lucas and Irene. Lucas sets his comic down between them and stands on the bench to try and get a better look. Only his legs are in frame. Irene glares up at him. The hell are you doing now, kid? You'll break your neck. Anyone ever tell you that you're really negative? <laughs> Never came up. Cut to interior police cruiser, same time. Backseat point of view of a cop tapping his thumbs on the wheel of the car. His face is not visible in the shot. The radio crackles. 1180 Magnolia Boulevard and Main Street. The cop puts his cruiser into drive, and as, as he reaches to flip on a switch on the console, we cut to exterior bus stop, same time. Sirens wail in the distance, moving closer. Lucas still stands on the bench, only his legs are visible, and Irene continues to smoke and glare at him. Lucas's ratty sneakers are untied, the laces fraying. I told you. Lucas shifts from foot to foot like he's trying to get a better view of the wreck. I feel like I should do something. I work over there. The best thing you can do is stay out of the way. 
Lucas jumps down from the bench and re-enters the frame. I'm gonna check that no one's hurt. Tie your shoes first. Lucas looks down and begrudgingly does what she tells him to do. Cuts to exterior busy city street, dead. Tracking tight on Lucas's shoulders. We see him jog over to a car with a man in a business suit leaning out the driver's side window. The man is watching people scramble around the crash site, at least what parts of it can be seen. Lucas waves to him and walks over to his open window. Hey, is everyone all right? I heard the crash from the bus stop. I don't know. It's holding up traffic, though. Gonna make a lot of people late and pissed. Aren't you worried about the drivers? They'll be fine. Cops are on the way. Ambulance, too, probably. My boss is gonna give me so much crap for being late. Lucas looks completely appalled by the man's blasé reaction to the crash. He grits his teeth and walks away before he says something he'll regret. Cut to exterior bus stop, dead. Irene is exactly where Lucas left her. Her cigarette is almost completely out. Lucas enters the frame and drops heavily onto the bench. He picks up the comic and throws it into the street as hard as he can. Irene stares at him for a moment before standing up to pick up the now water-stained comic book. She sets it back down between them. Lucas's point of view. We see pale smoke rise from the intersection ahead. They're shouting and the sirens grow louder back to scene. Lucas is quiet for a moment, then. Your husband sounds like an a-hole. He is. Got any children? Jesus, kid. Again with the questions. Well, do you? A daughter. Why does it matter to you? What's she like? In rehab. Oh. Crap, I'm sorry. <sighs> Nothing to be sorry for. You didn't make her buy heroin from a sketchy guy named Greg. <laughs> you didn't make her overdose either. She did that on her own. Irene stubs out the end of her cigarette and lights another. Those can kill, you know. Thank God. <laughs> or you'll end up with a hole in your throat. Have you ever seen those commercials? Terrifying. Might be worse than dying. Irene takes a drag, then blows smoke in his face. Aren't you supposed to be in school? I can't pay rent and go to school. Don't change the subject. Lucas glares at her. My mom smoked a pack a day before she died. She never stopped coughing. She always smelled like stale cigarettes too and her perfume just made it worse. So it was lung cancer then? I didn't ask. They just told me she was sick and that was the end of it. I was still a kid when she died. You're still a kid? I don't know if the bus is coming. It should have been here by now. Irene stands to check the schedule again before sitting down. Lucas stuffs his comic into his, backpack, into his backpack, closing it. He looks down at his hands before he looks over at Irene. He pauses for a moment. Can I have a cigarette? Cut to exterior busy city street a few minutes later. The police are at the scene. Lights flashing, yellow tape blocks off the intersection. Bystanders five through 10 look at the crash site from behind the yellow tape. Two ambulances block most of it from view. A fire truck looms in the distance, blocking off the other side. The only sound that can be heard is the general commotion of inarticulate shouting and chaos of traffic and honking cars, but no discernible conversation is audible. Cut to exterior bus stop, same time. Lucas and Irene still sit on the bench, <coughs> each smoking a cigarette. <coughs> Lucas coughs convulsively, <coughs> and Irene laughs at him. <coughs> I don't know why you do that. <coughs> My lungs are on fire. <coughs> Makes me feel alive. Lucas drops the half-smoked cigarette on the pavement and stomps it out. I still feel like we should have done something. You're so worried about that darn wreck? God, kid, relax. Why didn't you do anything? Because it's not my problem. Well, it's never anyone else's problem. Doesn't mean you have to handle it by yourself. Usually that's exactly what it means. Irene drops her cigarette, crushing it underfoot. 
I mean, listen, do you really think all those headless chickens were running around the crash gave a crap about the driver? Well... Well, maybe one or two of them really did. But the rest of those idiots just wanted to see what happened. Lucas stares down at his shoes, looking wildly conflicted over what Irene said. Irene sighs at him and speaks as gently as her personality is capable of. Sometimes it's better to stay out of the way. It's kinder than pretending to care. But I do care. And you're something special, kid. But that doesn't mean much to other people. She stands, tucking her pack of cigarettes into her pocket and begins to walk down the street. She makes it a few feet before she stops and turns back to him. Shay, kid, what's your name? Fade, too. The Kintsugi Dinner Plates, written by Madison Grant. Castless, Margot, 25, female. Flora, 25, female. Harmony, early 60s, female. Curtis, early 60s, male. Fade in, interior apartment hallway, day. We open with a shot of a generic modern apartment. The hallway is bare decorated only with nondescript framed black and white photos. Interior apartment, living room, day. An open concept floor plan. We focus in the living room area of the apartment, but in the background, we see Margot out of focus in the kitchen. On the TV stand, there is a framed photo of two young women, a couple. One of them is Margot, and the other looks to be the same age. This is Flora Bogowitz. The rest of the living room is empty, furnished only with a gray couch and a vacant coffee table. Interior apartment kitchen, same time. Marco sits at a kitchen bar. The kitchen is clean, white, annoyingly middle class. Margot, 25, is pretty with a hardened exterior, the kind of hands you know could choke a man. She holds her phone to her ear and we realize she's been talking on it while we've been in the apartment. We only hear her side of the conversation. Yeah, I don't know. No. Okay, but that was one time. I don't care. She's frustrated. What? No, I guess, I know, I know. Whatever, you're right. <laughs> sure. Dep Daphne. She's not being listened to. I'm not going to break up with her. Or I will. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> There's just like a lot going on. I don't know. I just feel like I'm about to lose it. Sure. But I want to make sure she's not in the middle of anything first. What do you mean, like what? Flora does things. She, she's got her... She pauses. She can't think of anything. Her... You know, stuff. <laughs> Yoga. She was telling me yesterday how stressful her last class was. I think the goats escaped or something? Interior apartment complex hallway, same time. Standard white walls, gray carpet, numbered doors. Forward tracking shot. We follow the back of Flora's head as she speed walks through the hallway. She is 25, squishy, delicate, and utterly the kind of hippie no one's seen since the 70s. Everything about her jangles, her dress, her jewelry, even her hair is bouncing. She's fast. Interior, apartment, kitchen, same time. Margot continues her one-sided conversation. Daphne, a week isn't going to kill anyone. I'll break up with her next Friday, okay? It's not like one week is gonna kill me. <laughs> Pause. She listens to Daphne on the other end. What? No, it's not weird to have a plan. Interior, apartment complex hallway, same time. The same forward tracking shot. Flora, 
is further down the hallway now. From the back, we see her take out her phone and type something. Interior apartment kitchen, same time. Margot's phone dings. She lifts it away from her ear and reads the text. Her expression morphs into one of horror. She brings the phone back to her face. Daphne, Daphne, I gotta go, I got to go, she's here. She stands, not knowing what to do. She throws her phone toward the kitchen table and runs to the door. Interior apartment complex hallway, same time. Same forward tracking shot. Flora nearing Margot's door. Her hand closes around the doorknob. Interior apartment hallway, same time. The back of Margot's head as she opens the door. For the first time, we see Flora's face. She's pretty, smiling. Immediately, she kisses Margot very quickly and breezes past her. You're meeting my parents. What? How, how in the hell did you come to that as a decision? We haven't even talked. I don't even know your parents' names. Flora turns around and walks backwards down the hallway. She brings her hands up and blows Margot a kiss. Interior, Flora's car, night. Margot sits alone, huddled against the window of the passenger seat of Flora's car. She doesn't know why she's here. The car is filled with strange knickknacks. Things hang from the ceiling with invisible string, coloring books, colored puff balls, a miniature Furby. Margot gazes out the window at exterior porch of the Bogowitz house, same time. Flora on the steps of a large suburban home surrounded by trees. She hugs two people, Harmony and Curtis, early 60s. Harmony is soft with gentle features and an unabridged weirdness. Curtis is plain, generic, exceedingly oblivious in nature. Everyone is very excited. Interior, Flora's car, same time. Margot sighs, she knows she has to go in. She steals herself, opens the car door, and gets out. With the slam of the car door, we cut to interior Bogowitz dining room, night. The weirdest dining room you can think of. There are too many colors, all equally displeasing and vomit-inducing to the eye. On the table sits disposable utensils next to beautiful Japanese kintsugi plates. Margot slumps in a chair at the table with the fakest smile in the world plastered on her face. Flora sits next to her with Harmony and Curtis across from them. Margot is mentally drowning. She hates this. The rest of the Bogowitz family <laughs> roars with raucous laughter. And Curtis, oh God, you should have seen him in those tiny little shorts with those goats standing on his back. Flora said it was all she could think about for weeks afterwards. She smiles as if recalling a fond memory. Margot looks like she's gonna throw up. That's not good, Mom. I had to give the clients behind him a discount for their next three classes. Curtis stands and tries to raise one of his legs. He's being a showman, although a bad one. Mm. You should have gotten him pay extra. People used to pay a lot back in the days to see these times. Oh, here he goes again. <laughs> Listen, 15 a pop. One peek at the right leg, boom. Rent's paid for a week. Do you want me to be homeless? Because if you do that, I'll definitely be homeless. Clients gone immediately. Being homeless would give you more character. I have enough character. <laughs> and that's totally not PC. Come on, we've talked about that. Pause. Harmony refills her plastic cup with a crystal water pitcher. Margot, have you ever done anything like that? Goat yoga? or selling my body because <laughs> the goats are more florist thing. The, the fur is a little too much for me. I'm with you there. I don't get all this new kind of hippie stuff. Back in the 70s, it was a lot simpler. You got your sticks, your posters, and you took to the street. Now, you gotta pay $100 to get some farm animal to stand on your back and reach enlightenment. It's not enlightenment, it's yoga. Weren't we here to talk about Margot? Margot looks at Flora. It's clear she's been thrown under the bus. Close up on Margot's leg as Flora smiles and cheerily taps Margot's thigh. Come on, tell them about that thing you do. What thing? You know, you get up, you go to work, all of that. 
You mean I have a life? I mean, you wake up at 7 a.m. every day to go make commercials. 7 a.m.? I work in advertising, yeah. Every day. Only the days I'm alive. Oh, I could never do that. They say getting up early ages you prematurely. All this oat milk probably does too. It has good antibodies, Dad. Margo reaches for the pudding. Without looking, Flora pushes Margo's hand away. What do you do when you get up that early? Your taxes? Do you have a windowsill planner that you fill? Yeah, I also bake pies and set them there so a mouse and a cat will enact Hamlet in my kitchen while I'm gone. I was only asking, dear. It's all you people seem to be doing. Margo! Whoa. Is everything all right, girls? I have some breathing relationship exercises you can do in the living room if you need to step away. Flora, there's even a goat-inspired one in the back of the book. Your dad loves that one. No, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Margo stares at the dirty plates in front of her. What kind of plates are these? Kintsugi. Japanese. They're made by mending broken plates with gold. Curtis loudly scrapes his disposable fork against the porcelain of his plate. It's awful. Margo stands and starts picking up empty plates. I'm sure they'll wash just as well with some Dawn dish soap then. Flora leans closer to Margo. She whispers to her. What are you doing? Oh, we don't have a dishwasher. We use organic sponges. Margo walks towards the kitchen with a stack of plates. As she disappears, Harmony and Curtis whisper to each other, eyebrows drawn tight. We can barely hear them. How strange. Someone doing dishes they don't own. <laughs> they didn't even do that in the 70s. Flora keeps a steady smile on her face. It falters slightly. I'll go check on her in a minute. I'm sure she has no idea what she's doing. Interior, Bogowitz kitchen, minutes later. The weirdest kitchen, nothing is normal. There are multiple different kinds of backsplash. The sink is yellow. At the sink, Margo scrubs at plates with an actual live marine sponge. Flora enters and takes up next to Margo. As Margo washes, she dries. They're a machine, unmatched. As they wash, they start at each other. I mean, what oh, the what hell is wrong with what's your that? Family? You just storm out of dinner and <laughs> just say you're going to do the dishes? I mean, who does the dishes at other people's house anyway? Does and you the dishes at were other people's in such houses. a bad mood on the drive over here like it makes no you sense. You didn't even think I could possibly be in a bad mood. You're Six. actually crazy. You're the most closed-minded person I have ever met in my life. Your parents use a live sponge on their dishes! So what? Maybe they didn't want to go to the store. Margot drops the dishes back in the sink. Water flies up, soaks the front of her shirt. Normal people go to the store! Oh, here you go again, normal people, with your whole milk and your paperwork and your insurance. Maybe, maybe I want to be normal. Maybe I like doing my taxes and getting up at 7 a.m. and doing the same job over and over again. Maybe she pauses, looks at Flora, the perfectly washed and dried stack of dishes they did together. You're too much. Okay. Okay. Margot, with her sudsy outfit and ragged hair, looks crazy now. Flora picks up the plates. I'll take those. What? I'll take them. She takes the stack of plates in her arms and walks into the living room. Interior, Bogowitz House living room, night. Margot moves through the weird living room toward the front door, and we see Harmony and Curtis watching her from two oversized chairs. Exterior, Bogowitz house lawn, night. Margot staggers across the lawn towards Flora's car. As she gets closer, she realizes she has no way home. She didn't drive. And her face morphs. She's wild. She bashes a plate against the car. Frisbees another one towards the house. 
As she goes through the stack, she throws with more vigor. Laura runs outside and goes for Marco. Laura laughs <laughs> as she gets closer. This is fun for her. It's weird. It's her normal. Margo spots her. What? What is it now? Are you going to tell me about your chickens? Your, your organic meatballs that you make on Tuesdays instead of tacos like everyone else? Look at this. Look. She holds one of the plates high above her head. It's gorgeous. Come on. Tell me this was your favorite. Tell me. She's desperate. Still cool. Margo lets the plate slip from her fingers. It crashes against the ground, broken. Don't you get it? Don't you know why I'm doing this? They're, they're broken. They're broken. They're just plates, Margo. We can mend them. Come on, let's go inside. At this, Margo gets angrier. Sends plate after plate spinning into windshield, the ground, the porch of the house. She turns and turns and drops to her knees and starts crying. In the background, Laura picks up pieces of the plates, her laughter ringing as we fade to black. Wasting Disease by Adelina Rose Gowans. Ro, a 15-year-old girl. Jude, her 11-year-old sister. Interior suburban house. Messy teenager bedroom. Night. Ro, 15 and puffy-eyed, tries to fall asleep in her twin bed. Her sister, Jude, 11, loiters in the doorway of the room. Ro? Hey, Ro, are you awake? No. I want to tell you something. No. Jude walks into the room and lays down in the twin bed beside Ro, pushing her aside. There is a moment of silence. Ro turns over, away from Jude. Ro, I know you're still awake. Hey, listen. I started my period today. Oh, uh, cool, I guess. <laughs> did, the nurse get the, did the nurse get you some pads and stuff? No. Really? I didn't tell her. That's dumb. Why wouldn't you tell the nurse? That's like why schools have nurses, to get you stuff. I didn't tell anyone. Oh my god, why wouldn't you tell anyone? Literally get off my bed. You're probably bleeding all over my sheets right now. No, don't worry. I uh, stuffed a bunch of toilet paper in my underwear and took some of mom's ibuprofen when I got home. That doesn't work the same. Go get a pad out of the bathroom. But I really don't want feel like moving right now. Oh, whatever. Ro sits up in bed and sighs. Hey, Ro. Want to hear what this boy in class showed me? Probably not. Did you know the zombie apocalypse is real? No, it's not. Yes, it is, but not for humans. Just deer. Deer? Yeah, there's this thing. Uh, it's called a wasting disease. I think it's like this sickness where deer start literally decomposing, but their brains don't realize they're dying, so they just kind of walk around while their bodies fall apart. You can't be serious. I'm serious. He showed me this video with a deer that looked like somebody had straight up shredded its back off with a cheese grater. I felt terrible for it. I wanted to put a blanket over its back so bad, just cover it up somehow. I wish somebody would grate my back acne off like that. Don't say that! That's a terrible thing to wish for! Now that I have my period, I'm probably going to start getting acne, too. You'll wish for it to go away. No, I won't. I'd never wish for that. Then what would you wish for? 
If you had one free wish. Jude contemplates for a quiet moment. I think, I think I would wish for a new name. Yeah, I would, I wish I had a name that was more like princessy, you know, like fabulous. There's this girl in the class above me, Gabriella. Gabriella. Her name takes up so much space when you say it. Jude is like a punch. Also, sometimes when substitute teachers take role, they think I'm a boy. That's a stupid wish, too. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Jude's a cool name. It's sharp and smart. But plus, Mom and Dad named you after Jude Law. Do you realize how epic that is? He was literally knighted by the French Order of the Arts. How many people can be like, yeah, I was named after a French Knight of the Arts? I guess Jude Law is pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. Now we both have to change our wishes. We don't have to, we don't have to. We can just not wish for anything at all right now. Okay, I don't wish for anything. <laughs> okay, I don't wish for anything either. I think I'm bleeding through my toilet seat cup. <laughs> well, if you won't go get one yourself, I'll go get you a pad. Interior suburban house, kids' bathroom, night. Ro rummages through messy cabinets under the bathroom sink just down the hall from her bedroom. Footsteps pad in the hall, then a thud, as if someone sat down outside the closed door. Do you have any tampons? No. In the messy cabinet, a box of tampons is clearly visible. I'm pretty sure you have tampons. I want tampons. Don't be annoying. I'm trying to help you. Tampons feel weird. You'll like pads better. Oh. Ro stuffs a handful of pads into her travel cosmetics bag. Hey, Ro. What? I really wish I'd never seen the wasting disease video. Was it scary? I mean, yeah, but that's not the bad part. It's just that I can't stop thinking about it. You know how Dad says he doesn't like horror movies because the images get stuck in his brain and somehow and show up at creepy times? That's how I feel. I can't stop thinking about it. There's no cure for wasting disease. The deer just always die. I'm sure they'll find a cure someday. I'm sure, like, nature scientists or whoever works on things like that. But what about right now, Ro? There are deer dying right now, like I'm bleeding a little bit. But what about the deer? They're bleeding way more than I am, and out of a big, ugly gash, too. Is anybody out there putting blankets on their backs? Does anyone know where to find that? Chill out. It's way too late for this. I'm not mom, okay? Just, just stop thinking about it and go talk to mom in the morning. But I trust you more than anyone else. You're my sister. Ro turns and presses her face to the closed door. You're, you're gonna be okay, Jude. And the deer, they're gonna be okay too. Do you really think so? I promise. Interior suburban house, messy teenager bedroom, a few minutes later. Ro is back in bed, eyes closed, trying to sleep. Sitting on the edge of the bed, Jude holds the travel bag full of pads. She unravels the bloody toilet paper out of her underwear and replaces it with a pad, then lies down beside her sister. Ro? Ro? Are you still awake? No. Do you think the nature scientists are working right now? You ask way too many questions. Ro, please, don't you think they're working? I, I don't know, maybe. It depends on what time zone they're in. I mean, some scientists are, might be working right now, and some are probably asleep so they can start working again in the morning. I hope they find a cure soon. It's so creepy. Imagine dying and not knowing you're dying. You know, the first time I got my period, I thought I was dying. Really? Yeah. It came to me kind of early. Nobody had talked to me about it. I just woke up one morning and there was blood in my sheets. What'd you do? I told mom I thought I was dying. <laughs> and then she was like, 
no, you're not. And then she told me about period stuff. It's weird that people bleed like this. I feel old. <laughs> you're not. You're 11. I bet that's old for a deer. Maybe. How long do you think deer live? I'm going to sleep. Oh. Yeah. I, I bled through my toilet paper in bed. That's why I came in here. It's okay. We can pretend like you started your period tonight and I helped you. We can pretend like today wasn't real. Really? Would that be okay? Of course. Today wasn't real. No toilet paper. No deer. No toilet paper. No deer. Today wasn't real. I promise. Jude and Roe close their eyes. Fade to black. <laughs>